Welcome to the seventh video in this series on William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Now we're really into the heart of the novel. We're seeing some of the biggest changes and most significant forward steps and shifts in the narrative, the themes, the ideas and the way the ideas are being represented. We saw in the early stages of the novel this Edenic, beautiful version of the island. And as the novel progresses, we're increasingly seeing the brutal, harsh world of the nature and the island being truly revealed, as well as the way that the symbols are starting to shift and change. We are going to continue with our study of these big questions in the novel as a whole that shape and form our study. Uh, the first of those three for this video is in what way does the fallen pilot represent the boys and humanity at large? We see the question of the beast really being raised here, what that beast symbolises and represents, and that is most crucially centred around the dead pilot that the boys come across. Um, and then building on that, because they go hunting for the beast, why does Golding simulate the boys hunting as they find the fallen pilot? And what do they believe the beast is? And that allows us to comment on that darkness, that repeated phrase, darkness and dirt and filth, and the the kind of evil that the boys are experiencing, noticing and seeing. And finally, and more broadly, is what role do the rituals play in Lord of the Flies as a whole? And we'll think about the changing nature of those rituals as we move from civility to barbarism in the novel as a whole. Okay, so we have a passage in front of us from the end of Chapter 7, Shadows and Troll Trees, where the boys have been looking for this beast and they have finally come across what it really is. They can't identify it at this stage and they don't identify it at this stage. They just see this monstrous figure, but it is the remains of the parachutist, as we saw in the previous video, strung up by uh, the ropes on his parachute moving around in the wind. And there's lots of core big issues and debates going on here, uh, not least introduced with this first line here. Inside uh, Ralph's head, he's got this voice of reason. And we can see Golding trying to actively debate the balance between reason and instinct. Ultimately, it comes back to that division between civility and savagery that so much of the our novel and the discussion of the novel comes back to. But there is this wider issue of what it means to be human. And that Ralph is experiencing that tension. in his own mind. Um, and we've mentioned this context before, but there is an initial and, uh, and an exploration of psychology reflecting the mid 20th century in psychology and the mind. So we have that initial section there. Um, as we continue to move forward, we have a return of the same sort of language, the same semantic field that we started to see associated with nature. So we have this semantic field of animalism and harshness. This is associated with nature and the natural world and the presence of nature becomes more threatening as the novel progresses. And, you know, moreover, you know, we can have a look at this section here and we can see that the boys are only in rags now. So their school uniforms symbolic 
of British tradition and etiquette have been reduced to rags. Sorry, I do apologise. Have been reduced to rags. All of their old statuses are being broken and destroyed. And yeah, we see that particularly as, as the boys uh, paint their faces and they appear to be savages and they appear more like savages as the novel progresses and the narrative progresses. And um, we saw in earlier chapters, and we've commented on this in earlier videos, the presence of fear and this commentary on fear. And we see that coming through here again. The boys are now creeping forward. It's interesting um, that it's Roger who's lagging because we actually see Roger is almost more sadistic uh, and harsher, more brutal than even Jack is. But they are creeping forward. So there's several ways that we can read this. We can either read this as fearful as though they are intimidated and scared by the idea of the beast. Or this is them imitating hunting and the process of hunting as if the act of hunting has become another ritual and another barbaric ritual at that. And in the previous video, we commented on the way in which the rituals on the island start to become increasingly barbaric and increasingly harsh and violent, completely detached from the civility that we would expect to be expressed by boys who are the supposedly British school boys who emanate the power and the prestige of the British Empire. You know, they are being reduced here to savages. Their clothes are being reduced to rags. They're cut increasingly dirty and that, is, that dirt is associated with their descent away from civility and towards savagery. So as we continue to move forward, um, we have this description um, and the first description of this creature. So this, in this quite simple, blunt, simple sentence, there's quite a lot to be said here. Uh, to begin with, we have... The fact that it's referred to as a creature. So there is no sense or understanding from the boys of what it is. The beast is associated with fear, but the boys are unable to define their fear. And then, moreover, we have this verb bulged, as though it grows, develops, it changes shape. But if something's bulging, it lacks definition. And we have to remember, literally, this is a rotting corpse being strung up. So it is a, it is a body, but it will increasingly lose its sense of definition. It lose lose the things and the qualities that makes it human. So this monster lacks humanity. Um, and that is perhaps a comment, and I'll just squeeze this in here, on the way humanity has lost its sense of peace and civility. Morals have been destroyed and they've lost their shape in the same way that this body that the boys see has done. Now, we've referred to this island in this setting as Edenic uh, as we've moved along and we've moved through the novel. But here we see um, a reminder of the damage that the boys have done because Ralph puts his hand in the cold, soft ashes of the fire and smothered a cry. We are truly... 
in a dystopia now. These are the results of the fires and the damage caused by the boy. This Edenic, idyllic landscape has been changed and harmed. And the fact that we have this ash, once something's reduced, once reduced to ash, it can never be recovered. Again, it's as though that the world, once damaged, can't be healed. Now, as we move uh, through the passage, we have that repetition of ash again. It blows into Ralph's face from the dead fire. So we have that same idea, that same issue being repeated again. But it's the ash that is covering Ralph. That that destruction is tainting Ralph. And indeed, we have that idea finished and finalised here because Ralph, to confront the beast, fuses his fear and loathing into hatred and stands up. So all of that destruction, all of that damage is fused in this verb into fear and loathing into a hatred. So Ralph begins to abandon his civility. He becomes increasingly impulsive and a reminder that hate that hatred is associated with destruction. So even Ralph is falling and failing and the leaders on this island are falling and failing um, and you know an element of context that's worth considering is that fear and loathing are tools that particularly in the second world war are tools that pop that propaganda drove and it led to division and the separation and the increasing racist views that were associated with the Nazi regime, with these tyrannies, as they sought to wipe out uh, communities, societies, faiths, ethnicities. And we saw the way in which that fear and loathing made ethnicities and religions distrusted, ostracised, and then persecuted. So we have then in this passage an awful lot of symbolic meaning going on, a lot of commentary in terms of some of the contextual issues, and we see that track and trace and develop as we move through. Um, so we have then that same those same questions of fear coming up again here because Jack is almost teasing Ralph. So Jack is egging on Ralph. He's forcing him to act. There is this masculine bravado that is being encouraged. Bravado is where you play up. So playing up to these gendered stereotypes. And the bo and that Ralph is being driven to change by these more harsh, brutal, increasingly savage figures of Roger and Jack. But it's interesting, of course, that immediately next and immediately afterwards that Jack slid away from him um, and that Roger bumped and fumbled. So, of course, these figures can't quite 
manage the responses that Ralph can at this point. I think this next quotation here is interesting. He's just, Ralph is described as not so much scared as paralysed. Hung up here, immovable on the top of the diminishing, moving mountain. So there is the there is this slipperiness here. It's not quite entirely clear what's quite being described, whether this is Ralph or the airman. But this paralysis. We have these figures stuck in stasis. They can't move, and they can't change now. Um, and the fact that they're hung up here. There is the feeling and the sensation that they are trapped and that they can't escape. But once again, we have this repeated language of th this repeated language that makes the this monster, the airman, seem indistinct somehow. We have, as we commented on earlier, it bulging. We have the hump. But again, we have this rock like hump. So there is a sense here that the, there is no way for the boys to define what the monster is or the beast is. So the beast is a symbol of the darkness of humanity that's in the boys as well but at this point it can't be defined and they fail to understand this so because the boys can't see that the the beast is actually just an airman uh, up there they are not able to see that it's humans that are the beasts that are the monsters that's humans who are the ones who behave in this monstrous way and they fail to see that they can't see that and in fact, that vague, ill-defined language continues because it's then described as something like a great ape. Well, it's interesting, of course, an ape, it's this primitive version of humanity. And of course, then we have the beast associated then with barbarism, with impulsiveness, and with savagery. This beast, it's really the airman, is a reflection of the savagery of the boys and of humanity. as a whole and that is really strongly reinforced as we move to this quotation and we are shown as the wind pulls it up the ruin of a face so we're going to focus on this lexical choice here of ruin if the air body the airman is a reflection of the uh, of the savagery of humanity then and his face is ruined Humanity has been symbolically ruined, harmed, and destroyed. The face is somehow rotten. Humanity itself has become rotten. And that word, that rottenness, Ralph identifies in the island as well. So we're seeing the way in which the world of this novel, the narrative of this novel is set uh, on this island. The island is increasingly reflecting the savagery, brutality and failures of the boys. By the same token, then, the ruin of this man's face shows us the way in which humanity itself has become ruined. And once again, as we've mentioned uh, earlier in this section, the wind roaring up here. And we have it come back again. As we come back down through this passage, we have the wind roaring again.
so that nature appears to be raging and furious just like the savagery and barbaric nature of the boys. Okay, so we've looked closely at the end of chapter seven and we've thought about it. So we're going to start uh, with this quotation, something like a great ape was sitting asleep with his head between his knees and we're going to come to that one of those first central big questions uh, that we've been studying in this chapter and we've been thinking about really closely um, and it's in what way does the fallen pilot represent the boys and humanity at large so if we just put in there theme one the fallen pilot represents humanity so we've looked at this we're just going to come at it again so something like that indistinct phrase great ape sitting asleep and its head between its knees so lots to unpack in here to begin with we're going to start here with this indistinct image there is the uncertainty of the boys they can't see its human form and they can't see the evil and savagery inherent in this and humanity at large. So we have that as a starting point. Then we move into this next step of the image of this great ape. So number one, there's a hugeness there. And very often this is in contrast to the boys being described as small. We can think about the moment Simon is killed. He's described as being very small. But here there is a hugeness. There is a threat. But also the ape is a primal being. It's a base barbaric figure. It's the unevolved version of humanity. And again, perhaps tying back to this image and thought that humanity is just reducing back to its most savage, barbarous and most barbaric basis. Now, here we have and we can see it's sitting asleep. Now, this reminds me in the previous chapter, and we mentioned and looked at this quotation in the previous video of the Leviathan. So these figures and forces that are asleep. So we'll add a little cross-reference there to the Leviathan. The monstrousness is always asleep. But Golding portrays them as though they are about to wake up. There is that constant tension that surrounds this. It's as though the savagery and brutality is about to wake up. Which makes sense as the boys engage in increasingly savage, violent and brutal behaviour. The world that surrounds them and the symbols that surround them are increasingly close to waking up. And here, finally, we have it with its head between its knees. So this is a really ambiguous image we could read in lots of ways. Uh, it could be as though it's in prayer. Hope, there's a hope there. There's a faith there. That there is some desire to heal. But equally, with its head between its knees, it's as though we have a figure exhausted. Perhaps that humanity itself has been exhausted um, as though it as though it's given up as though it's as though it's giving in as well so we see just from that quotation and that range of symbols a really complex wealth of different ideas but this fallen pilot representing humanity this increasing movement towards savagery and i've picked up on this lexical field this savage lexical field of the boys being dirty only now wearing rags and then being painted 
So where we see the pilot being described as something like a great ape. So if the pilot is like a great ape, the pilot has become less evolved and it mirrors the process of the boys too. They've gone from uniforms, you know, we think about the robes of the choir, for instance, that Jack led when they arrived at the start of the novel, to barely being clothed. That dirtiness, the blackness, we can even think about the soot that is on them. They wear the darkness that reflects the darkness of humanity. They're only wearing rags. The last vestiges, scraps of civility are being torn from them. And then finally this word painted. They are assuming the identity of the savage. And it masks their previous identity. So we're just now going to look at this final and third quotation and we're tracking and tracing still this fallen pirate representing humanity, that increasing brutality of humanity. And this is a really famous one. We're going to come back to this quotation again and again because it captures many of the most significant ideas in the novel. Uh, and it is from the cry of the hunters right at the end as the uh, as the boys are rescued. And we are shown with filthy body, matted hair and unwiped nose, Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart. So we have here this filth and this filthiness and it's repeated and traced through. We've seen already that repeated pattern, that same sensibility again and again and again um, come through the novel. OK, so we have that all the time. We have that come through um, and we have that same repeated sensibility. So we have a return to focus on the filthiness. And that, and that comes to show the boy's descent into savagery. Um, same idea here with their matted hair, um, but equally their unwiped nose. I think that's a particularly childlike image that they have been uncared for. Perhaps that humanity has not been cared for and abandoned, just like the boys. And we have then here, Ralph, in this famous quotation, weeping, this intense, sadness because it is this moment of realization ralph perceives that he like humanity is not innocent but is in fact deeply flawed that humanity is fatally undermined by an inevitable undeniable and inescapable darkness a brutality and a violence that does tremendous and significant harm and for the first time, we have this widening out because it is the darkness of man's heart. Perhaps this is the moment Ralph leaves the liminal space of the island 
and it is this moment of recognition as he finally develops and sees the truth. So we've been looking at these three questions and we've had these three questions in the back of our mind as we've explored chapter seven. In what way does the fallen pilot represent the boys and humanity at large? Why does Golding simulate the boys hunting as they find the fallen pilot and what they believe is the beast? And what roles do rituals have in the narrative of Lord of the Flies? So that fallen pilot, it is a figure that has become completely indistinct. The boys can no longer see what it truly is. The boys are not able to see that it's a man that's up there. It's a figure with a face that's been ruined. So it's that figure has lost all sense of humanity. It's instead described like a great ape. It's as though humanity itself has become tarnished and ruined and spoilt. And in the same way, the boys have equally become tarnished and ruined and spoiled. Humanity as a whole is less than it was. Humanity as a whole has lost its sense of civility, its sense of honour, and instead has woken up to its barbaric harshness. And indeed, if we can see the way in which the boys see the fallen pilot in that way, and we see that reflection between them, the island also has that same sensibility, that same sense of being tarnished and damaged and ruined. The island begins as this beautiful, Edenic place, but the boys and the presence of humanity tarnish it, harm it, destroy it. It's difficult to say where Golding places the blame, whether it's humanity being inherently evil, inherently barbaric, or whether humanity um, has, as a result of the damage that's been done, it's too late to turn back, too late to change, too late to fix that harm, as we see in the symbolic scar that's left on the island as well. But equally... Why does Golding then simulate the boys hunting as they find the fallen pilot? Because this beast, this monster, is something they can't identify. They Even Simon cannot truly quite perceive it. And we've looked at quotations in earlier videos in this series uh, where, we, where we've seen that really clearly. But the boys still go through that simulation of hunting um, and going after the beast as though this is some sort of test of strength. And I think what's really significant is they go through this act of hunting and earlier in the novel, Jack successfully kills the sow and he passes that strength of test. Uh, sorry, that test of strength. But here they fail it. They fail in that test. They fail to overcome this darkness because this beast is associated with the evil that's inside all of humanity, with the fear that the boys have of it as well. But they are unable to tackle it. They are unable to hunt it. They are unable to capture it in the same way. That, the, that humanity as a whole is unable to defeat that darkness that lingers within it, is unable to erase the darkness that lives within the beating heart of every human as far as Golding is concerned. And, you know, this is an increasingly dystopian novel with the island having begun as this apparent paradise and is now descending into this dark, dangerous, threatening world full of threat that is currently asleep, as we see in the figure um, of the pilot, as we've looked at in this video, but also in that sleeping Leviathan that we saw in the video before as well. And that brings us to this wider question. It isn't just in this section of the novel, but is uh, in the novel as a whole is the role of rituals. We see the ritual of the conch, and it's described as pleasing in the opening of the novel. The, the process of democracy and the ritual of democracy where they vote and they pass the conch round and they take turns is, is reassuring somehow. And as the novel progresses, that ritual is replaced by the ritual of hunting, particularly when they, they're chanting and they're dancing together in this symbolic way. So we move from that representation of democracy into this representation of savagery. The ritual goes from being protective, where everyone's voice is, is recognised in turn, depending on who holds the conch, to that ritual being replaced by the ritual of hunting be it that ritual being played out and rehearsed or actually actioned by going and hunting for and killing the sow. Of course, it's ultimately that same ritual that leads to Simon being murdered and killed, being mistaken for a beast and being described as this tiny beast. Um, and so that question of what is the beast on the island is constantly coming up again and again. No one can truly define it. Simon's mistaken for it completely foolishly and completely pointlessly. Um, and then by the end of the novel, 
Um, those rituals have truly broken down and the hunt has fully turned and transformed into the hunt for Ralph as the boys are pursuing him, fanning the flames of fire on the island, driving him out so that they can kill him. That full descent from savagery, um, that full descent from democracy and order and civility to savagery and barbarism is complete and finished by the end of the novel. And it is those rituals that change as the novel progresses that really uh, makes that come through all the more strongly.